Hello, BookTube. I hadn't planned on going to the Brattle Bookshop today. Those of you who are new to the channel, the Brattle Bookshop is a great used bookstore in the heart of Boston. I've been going there forever and ever and ever. They are uh, full of books, and there's a sale lot next door that has thousands more books for for a dollar or three dollars or five dollars, so extra cheap. Uh, and they also have a huge amount of turnover, so you can find something new there almost every day. Uh, but I hadn't planned on going to the Brattle Bookshop today. I was, uh, I'm on deadline all weekend long, and I thought that would be the bulk of my attention, but there seems to be some sort of bookish arms race going on <laughs> in, in the ranks of the OGBG, mainly between myself and Jason Harrigan at Byways in Brooklyn. Uh, every time I pull ahead with a book haul, Mark Richardson at Richardson Reads or Jason or somebody will pull ahead with another book haul of their own, and it leads to taunting on Voxer. Jason has taken to leaving taunting messages for me every time he pulls ahead. He filled his car boot with books the other day. Went to five or six shops. Car people. They have an unfair advantage over us pedestrians. <laughs> but he leaves taunting Voxer messages in the form of filthy lyrics. <laughs> I won't... You can probably guess what he rhymed with annotated, but I don't even want to tell you what he rhymed with index. <laughs> so... I felt the honor of the Donahues was at stake, <laughs> so I went to the Brattle Bookshop uh, to hunt for books. Never all that much of a hardship. There's always something there that I want. And I found a bunch of books, and I want to show them to you. Now, I mentioned the other day, the last time I did a Brattle sale haul, that uh, there are grooves. You don't go to the Brattle demanding things, especially the sale lot, which is totally unorganized. And is replenished all the time. Although today, the opposite of replenishment was happening. I always, I always cringe a little uh, because at the back of the sale lot of the Brattle Bookstore, there's a dumpster, and that is where the books are faded that do not move. <laughs> and sometimes you'll go there to browse the books, and one of the people who works at the Brattle will be in the back of the sale lot just chucking books into the dumpster. <laughs> it's very, very disturbing. Even though, you you know, your eye has been over every one of those books and you have turned them down. You have passed on them. Even so, you can't... When I see it, I can't help but think, well, what about... What if the perfect person for one of those books was going to be here today? And it's too late. Uh, but uh, I've mentioned... you, you Yeah, you don't, you don't go to the Brattle sale lot where everything is just completely random with an agenda in mind. If you do that, you will jinx your own karma. You won't find anything. You won't find, you know, if you go to the Brattle sale lot and say, well, what I need is Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. <laughs> you not only won't find that, you won't find anything that you want. The, the Brattle gods are very, very watchful. <laughs> uh, but, although I don't go with a shopping list in mind, I do go with grooves in mind, right? Everybody has interests. You have interests and things that, that, will will cause you to pull them. What I do, my sort of routine at the in the Brattle sale lot is to pull everything that interests me and just carry it around with me rather than hope that I will be that I will remember where it is or that somebody won't grab it in between then and there. So I, I have I have an armload of books by the time I was I was done out in the lot. And I pull stuff that's of interest to me and then when I'm done I sort of settle the whole thing down on an unused cart and examine what I want and winnow what I want. So, you know, I pull everything, but then some things go back. Some things just aren't worth it, even at a, at a cheap price. Uh, so I have a handful of books here, and the first one is one of those grooves, and that is The City of Venice. Uh, those of you who are who are new to the channel, I used to live in Venice. I lived there for a bit of time, and I loved it. I dearly loved it. Uh, I got to know every inch of the city, every inch of, of the, the islands, every inch of the, the surrounding countryside, uh, and fell in love with it. Deeply fell in love with it. It's my second favorite place on Earth. Um, I, if I, I always used to say, if some natural disaster were to strike Boston, uh, then I would move to Venice and live there. Uh, but Venice is far more likely to be the victim of a natural disaster than Boston is. Venice is sinking under the water. Uh, the The Seasonal flooding is worse every single year. Uh, the other thing that I had in mind when I would think, well, I often do still think about moving back to Venice. And when I do that, the other thing that was on my mind was, well, let, you know, what if America were conquered? What if you, the, the conquering hordes of some country were on the border and you had to flee? That's where you would flee to. Uh, and I always laughed. I always chuckled at that. But America is changing. And, 
And so that's not as theoretical as it once was, not across the border, but from inside. But even so, Venice is uh, a billionaire's playground now. There's hardly anything in the way of normal living that can be done by normal people for a normal monthly rent. Uh, I could probably find such a place uh, if I looked hard enough, but uh, instead I'm, I am visiting Venice vicariously, and uh, that's one of the books that I found today was on Venice. It's this thing. It's a big uh, picture book by uh, Frederick Vitu called Living in Venice. And it is its focus is Venice looking out the doors, out the windows, rather than in. It's it's supposed to be focusing on normal Venetian life. So there you'll get you'll get water stair entrances just off a small a small canal, and uh, that's that's supposed to be the focus of this thing. But you can't ever do that. You can't ever pull it off because a lot of Venetians who have homes and apartments like that don't want you inside. They don't want to share their lives with you, so so they're private, and their their houses don't have a public facing face. So invariably, in books like this, you end up having to go to boutique homes, to uh, to places that are virtually museums. People might live in the upper stories, but uh, but they're virtually museums. They aren't where normal people live. This book the, has a bit of. Uh, Photography where normal people live, but not not as much as I would hope. Uh, see, you've got you've got water entrances there with people just ordinary people just doing loading or or that sort of thing. Uh, and it, but it has beautiful photography out in, throughout, and I will I will I'm sure I will enjoy the uh, the narration. And this one also comes with a 2009 menu <laughs> uh, from the Walter Piston Society. This is the, the pre concert dinner will feature wild mushroom cappuccino, microgreens with mushroom chopsticks, so even the chopsticks will be edible, uh, miso roasted cod, uh, gold beet risotto, pea shoot salad, a lemon souffle, and then a list of the wines that will be <laughs> that are being served. <laughs> so I imagine this was, I don't know, uh, maybe this was in somebody's bag or something or other. I, I, this will go on the shelf. I have a shelf of Venice books, but first I will... Uh, just explore it. I explore it vicariously because I don't think I'm ever going back to Venice. I don't think I'm ever going to see it again. Uh, and I, almost certainly, at some point in this book, when the photography goes to the Dorsoduro, which was the, the area of Venice where I lived, uh, and where a lot of the books of photography of these things happen, uh, invariably, I'm sure, when I that when I'm paging through these photos, I will see photos that are either real close to where I used to live, or that are photos of one part of where I used to live, which is always, that's always bizarre and amazing. There is a picture in here, uh, I don't know if I'll be able to find it quickly, there is a picture in here of uh, the type of site that I often saw uh, in Venice, uh, which is, uh, and which was sort of the, uh, the imprecise, uh, inspiration for a couple of stories that I wrote for Camp NaNoWriMo that, uh, that were set in Venice. I, I'm uh, contemplating, I'm, I'm thinking nonstop about NaNoWriMo because the two Camp NaNoWriMos are done now. Uh, and all that's left is the real thing, the big NaNoWriMo in November. And that is obviously making me wonder what I should write for, camp, for NaNoWriMo itself. Should I write a murder mystery? Or should I maybe write a big novel about Venice? Not a, not a, a minor thing, but a big thing. My get get Venice, so to speak, completely out of my system when it comes to fiction, uh, and it it would form a, a, around something like this: a young person just sitting in one of Venice's rare gardens, sketching or reading or whatever. Uh, something like that would be the 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 grit that forms the pearl. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I don't know one way or another. I I have a long way to go. Uh, until NaNoWriMo, I, I plan on making a series of AuthorTube videos about gearing up for NaNoWriMo and about writing just in general, because I, I really enjoy writing-themed videos. I just don't do them, that's all. Uh, but then, these next four, uh, it looked like the Brattle maybe got uh, bought a lot from somebody of Revolutionary-era histories. There were quite a few of them, uh, and I didn't want to overdo it. Uh, so, especially since I, a lot of these things I'm sure exist on eBooks, uh, but I got, I did get four of them, 
and they were all from the same person. All these books were sold to the Brattle uh, by the same person. And you might wonder how I know that. Well, they had a very distinctive method of tabbing their books. <laughs> I am not going to leave these this way. I am actually going to take the time to pull all those things out. <laughs> but in the meantime, I don't know. I, at first I thought, when I saw these, if you went to this much bother of doing all of these tabs and books, and a lot of them have writing of what the tab is leading you to, why would you ever give them up to the brown? Of course, I thought, well, if you died. <laughs> you wouldn't have a choice in the matter if you died. Uh, so the first one is uh, by uh, Walter Bornman. I believe I have written about some of these books. Again, if I, if I can find, if I remember, and I can find uh, reviews, I will, I will gladly uh, add them down below. This is the French and Indian War. Deciding the Fate of North America by Walter Bornman, uh, with plenty of tabs. Uh, and this this is, uh, I think all of these are from a time when I was back in reviewing. 2006. All right, so this is a little bit before. This was the year before. Uh, I'm sure that I read it, or maybe I saw it at the bookstore. I, it's not ringing any bells. So, And the French and Indian War is, of course, of interest to me. We will see... Uh, we'll see what stance the author takes with young Lieutenant Washington, who started the French and Indian War and then and and then bungled from one misstep to another throughout the whole of its length. Uh, this next one I already know <laughs> what that is because this is a book I have had before, uh, and I think it's brilliant, just fantastic. The more I reflect on it, the more impressive I think it is. This is by David Preston, and it is Braddock's Defeat. And some of you will know that name already. This is the Battle of the Monongahela, where the British commander was badly beaten. His forces were badly beaten uh, by the French and by their, their American Indian allies. And uh, Lieutenant Washington figures in this as well, because he comes off unscathed in, in the battle and actually has, has been referred to, was referred to at the time as the hero of the Monongahela. Uh, when there wouldn't have been a fight if it hadn't been for Washington's own bungling the year before. <laughs> but, but anyway, uh, this is just the definitive study of of this battle. And I have had it. I had it uh, from the publisher uh, in advanced copy and in finished copy. This is 2007, I believe. Uh, oh, no, 2015. Uh, I had this from the publisher in advanced copy and in finished copy, and uh, then I got... I got rid of the advanced copy. I kept the finished copy until somebody I knew wanted it, so I gave it to them, and then I found another copy of this book in hardcover. I got that, and then I got rid of that, and now I have this again. I have never yet seen, still, after all this time, five years, I have never yet seen a paperback of this book. Don't know if it has a paperback. Don't know if I'm blurbed on it. Uh, but I will. I know that I wrote a review of that, so I'll try to remember to leave uh, the review down below. And then the next two both of which are carefully tabbed. <laughs> the next two are on the same subject, and that is uh, the Battle of Bunker Hill uh, that was right here in Boston and that started, that that gave an opening glimpse of so much of what would happen militarily in the American Revolution. Just a fascinating study. Very small study, but fascinating. The first one is by James Nelson, and this is with Fire and Sword. This is a study of Battle of Bunker Hill and the Rise of George Washington. Uh, and then this next one is uh, The Whites of Their Eyes, and this is by Paul Lockhart. And this is also about the Battle of Bunker Hill, the Battle of Breed's Hill, and the Rise of George Washington, who takes control of the Continental Army on uh, Cambridge Common. Uh, and this Paul Lockhart is the brother of Keith Lockhart, the director of the Boston Pops. Uh, and I read both of these. I don't know if I reviewed either one of them, uh, but uh, these two are right now the only two books that I have exclusively on Bunker Hill, except for uh, is the name's gone right out of my head. Mark Richardson would know. Uh, now We Are Enemies was the original title of the book. Is it Fleming? Is it Thomas Fleming who did it? The, I have an older study of the Battle of Bunker Hill, and now I have these two new ones that probably uh, have a lot to say. I myself it, don't mind at all. Those of you maybe who maybe aren't familiar with reading history, don't read history for pleasure, might think, why would you get two books on the same subject? I love reading competing accounts, not necessarily competing, but complementary accounts of the same exact historical moment. I love that. Absolutely love it. Sometimes it can lead to enormous frustration because sometimes you get three chapters in and you realize these are not two variations on a theme. The second author is simply cribbing from the first author. That can be very frustrating. 
Uh, fortunately, I have the means at my disposal to chastise an author publicly about that, but, but even privately, that can be very disappointing. But I have found that often doesn't happen, especially in the modern day, where an author will be called on it immediately and where social media will make sure that everyone knows it. Uh, so these could, these will probably be, I think I have read uh, The Whites of Their Eyes. I don't know that I've ever read this one. But I'm always up to read about Bunker Hill. Absolutely. Uh, and this is a perfect example of what I've mentioned in Mail Halls and Friday Reads videos. Uh, this is a perfect example of books that are simply going to immediately muscle their way onto an immediate TBR. I will read at least one of these four uh, carefully annotated Revolutionary War books, revolutionary or pre-colonial colonial and revolutionary books. I will read at least one of these tonight. Uh, probably The Whites of Their Eyes. Uh, and the others in due course. So I, I, I'm not I'm not snapping up shiny baubles here at the battle. I'm getting books that I'm definitely going to read, and the, and sooner rather than later. So uh, then this next one is something I've had before. I had this in a, a trade paperback years ago, uh, and got rid of it. No idea where that trade paperback is. It might have been lost in a move or something like that. Uh, but I remember really liking it, and it's been long enough so that it too can, can is a candidate to go straight on the TBR right away. And th this is by Arnold Brackman, and it's called A Delicate Arrangement. It was just a very simple cover. Just that on the cover and nothing on the back. Nothing at all. And the paperback was the same way. No blurbs, no summary, no nothing. This is about Alfred Russell Wa Lawrence. And, uh, Ru Al uh, uh, Alfred Russell Wallace and Charles Darwin. In 1858, Darwin had been sitting, just brooding on the miscellaneous notes and jottings and thinkings of his, that dated back for 20 years, about some kind of idea of evolution by means of natural selection. Something, some reorganizing principle about how the natural world works that Darwin got glimpses of. He got, he got hints and glimmers of them, the Galapagos with finches and tortoises and whatnot, and made jotting subsequent to that, but had no concrete theory, no, no concrete working system, as you would find a year later in The Origin of Species. And in 1858, Darwin got a packet from the Malay Archipelago, I think, from, from Alfred Russell Wallace, uh, uh, do we have dates here? Uh, yeah, 1858. From from is it is it the Malay Archipelago? Yes, he got a a soggy, travel stained, dirty packet of papers from Alfred Russell Wallace, who was a nobody. He was not he was not from a famous family like Darwin was. He was not socially prominent. He was not already a published and famous author like Darwin was. He was not uh, not anything at all. He was hardly ever in England. And and the papers. As every biography of Darwin will tell you, they virtually all say it the same way. The papers horrified Darwin when he read them. Because they were Alfred Russell Wallace working out a theory of evolution by means of natural selection. Totally independent of Darwin. He had no idea, no world did, had no idea what Darwin was thinking about for those 20 years. No idea at all. Wallace worked it out on his own. And sent it to Darwin as a foremost, one of the foremost uh, natural historians in the world. And said, what do you think? Here is my theory that that traits that are favorable to an organization to an organism in a breeding population uh, tend to be selected by reproductive pressures. That that if those traits are beneficial to a species, the species w will select them for furtherment in the next generation, and that the the portions of the breeding population that don't select those features will fall away, and that that accounts for everything. Not, not just that it accounts for the life forms that Wallace was seeing all around him in the Malay archipelago while he was drifting in and out of tropical fevers, <laughs> but also, by extension, everything. That everything in the world develops that way. That that is how life develops. And that that explains all the life that we see around us. And all of the Darwin biographies, when they get to this point in his biography, say that Darwin was horrified. Because here it was. And as the author points out in this book, the publication, facts in science are everything. And Darwin was presented with a dilemma. He had a clear written indication that someone he barely knew had come up with not just fragments and jottings and ideas, but the theory 
that was teasing at his mind for those 20 years. He had clear written proof that someone, basically an innocent, Wallace was not skilled in the ways of publishing in London for certain, uh, had come up with that theory. And Darwin panicked because he didn't want he didn't want posterity to be talking about Wallace's theory of evolution. He didn't want that. He thought <clears throat> the rough, some rough parts of this idea occurred to me a long time ago. I wrote jottings on this idea a long time ago. I've talked to friends about this idea over the years. Surely I have precedence. I must write this book. I must bury Wallace's book and write my own and rush it to publication, which is why when we did a read-along of Origin of Species, we talked about this, uh, that it's, it's why uh, in the prefatory material, the opening material of the Origin of Species, Darwin himself says that this is merely a precept. This is merely an abstract of a much longer book to follow. The, the, his comments, his own comments on the text bespeak speed. They bespeak a slightly hurried composition. This is why. This book tells the story of why, and this book delves into deep detail about the days, just a matter of days and weeks, where that decision was made, and where Wallace was essentially bought off and quieted, and Darwin was was uh, hurried to work into publication. That It's a fascinating story, absolutely fascinating, and I don't know of it being told any better than in this book. Probably that's inevitable. Probably the only way that you could tell this story with the, the detail and the fascination that it deserves is to give it its own book. And there have been many times uh, over the years where I have missed this book, where I have thought, well, I used to have that, and every time Darwin comes up, every time I think about him or read about him or have to write about him, I want to reread this book in part or in whole. And now I have it in a, in a hardcover, too, because that, that old trade paperback was fascinating because it had no adornment of any kind, which is almost unheard of in the book world. Uh, but it was a little bit flimsy. I mean, it wouldn't, it wouldn't have lasted. Uh, through a read, and this this will, so that's great. Uh, and then the last the last book will end as we began with vicarious traveling, uh, because it, my traveling days are probably completely over, out of town a bit, adjoining state maybe, but going to exotic places. I don't think that I will be doing that again in my life. I've done a huge amount of it. For those of you who are new to the channel, I've done a huge amount of that, but I think that's over. Uh, so travel writing becomes all the more interesting to me. And I found a book I've never seen before. That's a UK hardcover, I believe. Uh, is that right? Uh, it was HarperCollins, but this is not American HarperCollins. This is, this is the UK. This is A Book of Lands and Peoples by Eric Newby. A big collection of, uh, of travel writing. Uh, sparkling original anthology of travel writing from one of Britain's preeminent and best-loved travel writers. Now in his early 80s, Eric Newby has written many classic travel books, including A Short Walk in the Hindu Kush. Uh, and his work has helped to shape the nature of the genre over the last 50 years. In this collection of travel writing from around the globe and spanning several centuries, he employs his natural wit, flair, and keen eye for the unusual in choosing extracts uh, from, from you know all of those years. The one thought I have is that uh, we have seen? We may have seen this book before. I haven't. I, I set up the, uh, the the laptop to make this video right away to appease the OGBG to to get ahead of to keep up with the uh, the arms race here to close the missile gap between me and Jason Harrigan. So I didn't check, but I have a suspicion uh, that this book, which is called A Book of Lands and Peoples, is the UK version of what became in America the Norton Book of Travel which is edit, er, uh, edited by Eric Newby. I don't imagine that he edited two such versions, so two such books. I'd be willing to bet this is the same book. So I, I will compare it, and then I will decide which one I want. Or maybe I want them both. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so there you go. That is uh, a Saturday brattle trip uh, that was done specifically at the goading of Byways and Bookland. <laughs> so it's, it's, I lay it at his feet. Oh, it's still a nice haul, though. This is stuff that I de very much want. So we have... Uh, a Book of Lands and Peoples by Eric Newby, which may or may not be the Norton Book of Travel. <laughs> then we have A Delicate Arrangement by Arnold Brackman, uh, which is the detailed story of Charles Darwin stealing the idea of evolution by means of natural selection in order not to be scooped by a nobody. Kind of fascinating. Uh, then we have a bunch of American Revolution and Colonial Era books with Fire and Sword by James Nelson. 
about the Battle of Bunker Hill and everything before it and afterwards, because the Battle of Bunker Hill didn't last long enough to take a whole book, and uh, The Whites of Their Eyes uh, by Paul Lockhart, which is on the same subject. And then two very connected books on the pre-revolutionary, on the, the, the war between Britain and France uh, that led up to and opened the door to the American Revolution. We have Braddock's Defeat, uh, really, in a way, the find of the day, because I want this book in my collection. Uh, and the French and Indian War, uh, which is a, a, a short and hopefully pithy overview. Uh, and then finally, uh, Living in Venice, a picture book about my second favorite city in the world. <laughs> so so that is my, my Brattle Hall today. Uh, not not bad. It will it, it, you factor in the travel time, and also in this particular case, you have to factor in the 20 minutes it's going to take me to take all those anal retentive tabs out of those books. I don't want my books to look like that. Uh, but still, well worth the time. So I'm going to wrap this up for now. And I will, if I remember correctly, I will leave a link to all of the pertinent reviews uh, down below. And I will also leave a link to the instigator of this video, the troublemaker, Jason himself. Because <laughs> so, if you want one used book haul, from one member of the OB OGBG, then you'll want book hauls from all the rest as well. So I'm going to wrap this up, uh, but I'll be back. Thank you, book two.